Hi, Catherine. Welcome to the show. It's great to have you with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Michael. It's an honor and privilege to be with you. I'm always happy to have someone from fellow Canada and Albertan on the line. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. So what's the weather like up there today? It is white. The way I describe it is white. And what I mean by white is it's very snowy and the trees are all lined with frost. So before this call, I was uh, driving to an appointment and I was just noticing how beautiful it was despite it being so cold and how nature is just here for us to appreciate. So I hope your listeners, wherever they are, if they could just take a pause and look around and take in nature for whatever it is, whether it be an ocean, whether it be a mountain, whether it be a, you know, a forest or uh, a city landscape to just take in nature because it's pretty magnificent when we stop and pay attention. Yeah, that's one thing I've learned when I moved to Canada, that Canadians have a deep appreciation and respect for nature. They don't see it as an obstacle. It's seen as something to be celebrated and enjoyed. Even a snowstorm is celebrated up there. Mm -hmm. That's very true. Uh, nature not only is to be celebrated and enjoyed, I think nature is a teacher. Nature is our teacher. And in business, I think it really informs, can inform our strategy uh, in terms of what stage we're at of our business. So I think to follow the rhythms of nature is very, very, very important. And also to utilize nature as a teacher in what we're trying to create in our organizations. I like that because I've heard a few business leaders refer to companies as spiritual or organic organisms. And you need to understand and learn about how nature manages the life cycle of an organism to understand how to manage a business, whether it's young, whether it's declining, whether it's aging and so on. So it's a very interesting way of looking at it. But I'm going to start off this discussion by getting to one of the major concepts I've seen you put forward in, whether it's your book, it's your work and so on. And I'm going to pick my own words here, but the idea that companies need to be more humane. So my question to you is, aren't companies humane enough? Well, I think we need to look at the research. So the Awaken Company marries business research with practical know-how and wisdom traditions. Yes. And Michael, the majority of businesses, people aren't engaged. Yes. People rate the worst time of their day as their time with their bosses. Yes. And the majority of businesses don't survive past 10 years. So I think there is a real invitation to bring humanity back into our organizations. And I don't think it's rocket science. Yes. Uh, and I think, you know, the Awakened Company, we really work on, if you imagine, let's imagine an ocean yes. and yes. we put a drop of water in the ocean, Michael, and it ripples out. That's what an Awakened uh, Company or organization does. So we awaken ourselves as that first drop. Yes. And then we awaken our relationships, which is that, that ring. And the third is we awaken our teams, our organizations, our world, and it's all interconnected. And we all have a very important and divine role to play in awakening. Now, what you said is very interesting, and I want to unpack it for the audience so everyone can follow what you're saying. And I'm going to paraphrase it in some ways, and then we'll mm -hmm. jump back into it. When I asked the question, it was very interesting the way you responded it, and I liked the response. Because when I asked the question, I was looking purely about how a company engages with the world. But the way you answered is very interesting because a company can engage more humanely with the world, but if it is abusing its employees in the process of doing it, then it has a lot of work to do, right? Yes, Michael. And, you know, look at loneliness right now. Loneliness is so high. And I think we need to fundamentally take a step back. Often we're taught, you know, we need to go about the why first. Yes. And I actually think we need to go about who, who are we and how do we want to show up to empower the why? Yeah. Because unless we're truly present as, as leaders, it's very hard to ripple out our vision. Um, yes. So the invitation here is for us all to look at who are we and how are we really showing up for ourselves, for our relationships, for our companies, for our world. And right now, perhaps more than ever, at least in my history, we need to all be really showing up with our best selves and enabling all of our potential. In your experience, do you think leaders are doing that now, given all of the pressure with COVID and so on? Do you think that there's less of that or more of that? authenticity and willingness to see 
employees for what they're going through? Well, it's a bit of both. I think we're more aware. We're more aware. We're more aware of the challenges. And I feel like there's a knowing doing gap. When we look at the research on it, uh, for example, uh, for women, you know, the statistics aren't improving, they're getting more challenging. So I think what's beautiful is we're becoming more aware. And because we're becoming more aware, I think that that will really help us to act in different ways. So it's a bit of, it's a bit of both. And still, when I'm meeting with CEOs, they often say, you know, Kath, I really want you to help me go from zero to a billion dollars like you did with XYZ company. And that's the wrong focus, Michael. That, that financial focus, that financial and short-term focus, we've got it. it it's got to be shifted. The invitation here is ha- bringing humanity back. And we know that the business research says two-thirds of our emphasis on leaders should be on corporate or organizational health and one-third on financial results. We need both. And so the, we need to focus more on organizational health. Are we creating living, breathing organisms? And the way I would define an awakening, and I use awakening because, oh, we're always in a state of, of change. An awakening organization is one that is focused on solving a business problem, a problem that does not cause suffering to either humans or the planet. So, and then they um, weave in, you know, values that are in aligned with, with that. And it's putting the emphasis back on our people and also our inward experience of work. Okay. I like that. So basically what you're saying, and I like the premise is that profit should be a byproduct of doing the right things. Yes. And the business research continually points to that, that, our focus. Well, and I don't want to underestimate financial. Like I don't want to say it's not important because we do need to provide living wages to people and we do need to be profitable. So it's the, the alchemy is the focus on our culture, solving business problems, and then the financial results will come. However, the worst performing organizations are those that focus solely just on the financial Mm -hmm. and the the kind of the middle performing organizations are those that just focus on culture alone. So we really need both. And we also need to start thinking about our businesses in terms of long term. So most organizations, so if there's entrepreneurs listening to this call, you know, 75% of organizations fail within the first decade. We need to change this so that we create living atmosphere fears for our businesses and organizations to really thrive in. And, you know, you might ask, well, how do we do this? And again, thinking of those concentric circles, like, okay, awakening ourselves. Well, how do we, how do we exactly awaken ourselves? And what we know is that business leaders who are highly self-aware are higher performing. So how do we cultivate self-awareness in leadership? So some of the things that we do are things like we help leaders to create aims, their inner compass to go to their North Star, the Enneagram. I don't know if you're familiar with the Enneagram or not, Michael. No, I'm not. I looked at it on your web, but I think it's good to explain it to the audience. So the Enneagram is a profound uh, personality roadmap about how to be more present, how to be more here in our bodies so that we can have a positive impact on ourselves and also our world. And the Awaken Company, one of uh, my partners is Russ Hudson, who is the thought leader in the world on the Enneagram, who has taught anywhere from from China to to all throughout America. Mm -hmm. So it really does teach us how do we be more present? And there's nine types. So there's nine types. And one is the first one's a reformer. The second one is a helper. The third one is an achiever. The fourth is the individualist. The fifth is uh, the the investigator. The sixth is the loyalist. Seventh, enthusiast. Eighth, the challenger. And nine, the peacemaker. So everyone has a particular type. And once we learn our type, we can then understand what happens to us when we're under stress. What happened to us what happens to us when we're we're healthy and then how do we enable all of the different enneagram types within us and so that's a key tool that we use and it's an ancient wisdom tradition that actually originates from ancient egypt 
So we were using this ancient roadmap to help leaders really ignite themselves and then ignite their teams. So then let's talk about the teams, because we've talked about igniting the individuals. There's some other things that, that, that we can do, but igniting, how do we ignite the teams? Well, first is our relationships. Like I see our relationships and I'm meaning our one-on-one -on -one relationships as the glue in organizational culture. And most people rate their time with their bosses as worse than taking out the kitty litter. Like, so we need to change this dynamic for both for, for, the, for our leaders and also for the people who are working with us. So how do we do that? And one simple, simple tactic is begin to notice the amazing things that your teammates are doing. It's a simple tactic and it creates high engagement because people want to continue doing the things yes. that they're noticed for. So um, that's, that's one thing to do. And we looked at it in terms of three kind of pillars, which is how do we become more heartfelt? How do we become more mindful? How do we become more spacious? And by spacious, we need to give people a sense of autonomy and a sense of control. So there's things we can do around each one of those pillars. Around the heartfulness is just genuinely taking time to connect individually with your team members and noticing the great things that they do. Number two, in terms of mindfulness, it's having times to brainstorm together and also times of pause together. So for example, at Blue Era, I founded um, with my colleague Shohana Siddiqui, a boutique executive search firm that became, uh, you know, Profit 10 in Alberta, our province, and Profit wow. 200 in Canada. And we were doing mindfulness way before mindfulness became, yes. became, became a thing. And we'd begin yeah. each meeting in silence just to ground, to be here. And it created a whole different field for us to, to work from. So there's, in terms of our relationships, there are some examples. And then in terms of organizations and getting back to this whole nature things, how do we create awakening organizations is, okay, we've got, we're working on ourselves individually. We're working on our relationships. And there's three key aspects. What are we energizing? So that's around vision, uh, goal setting. And you know what? I just have to say this. Everybody listening, most people don't know what their organizational vision is. That's when true. I go to, you know, how, do, how, do you have that experience, Michael? Oh, that's very common in every company I've ever been to. And so I want to share a story then about how I messed up as a leader uh, that I hope will inspire the people listening to this. Oh, I love stories where people mess up. Let's do this. <laughs> okay. So we're at a strategic planning session at Blue Era and everyone's around the table and I am the leader and I take full responsibility for this. And I'm like, okay, here's our vision, everybody. Let's, let's, here's the vision. And I was like, I'm like, this vision's so good. We've just got it. The team knows it. This is just so ingrained in who we are and what we do. And then we carried on. And I have a lot of energy. So I just kind of whipped through that section thinking that everybody had it and everybody understood it. And then about three weeks later, we brought a consultant in from Denmark because nobody in Canada were, was doing the types of things that we were doing. Yes. And the first question he asked Michael was, what's your vision? And he asked the team this question and I I sat on my hands just waiting because I'm like oh and you're gonna take it personally if they don't know it <laughs> well Michael and guess what <laughs> nobody raised their hands that is as I can totally believe that actually <laughs> like, it's, co it's completely common it's there's nothing unusual about it well, and that night, you can imagine, I cried myself to sleep. I was so upset. I thought as a leader, I had failed. You know, here I am. I'm trained and I have an MBA. I'm, I've run many, I, I led many organizations. I'm like, what have I done? You know, what have I, where do, I have really, really messed up. And then the next day, the consultant said to me, let's work on your vision. And it brought me back to one of Margaret Wheatley's core principles, which is people support what they create. And so we created a vision together and no one ever forgot the vision. And our team was so incredibly creative, Michael, they would create, um, you know, bins of popcorn with our vision on it and our values listed as ingredients. And we'd get various things made with the vision and values. And that was just a really 
important learning for me that I, I hope everyone listening gets it so that they don't repeat my mistake. And the other thing I learned about vision and values from that is the importance of repetition and mm-hmm. not only as a leader repeating it, having the team repeat it, repeat it in various ways. So that was a really, really important leadership lesson for me is people support what they create and in vision setting, it's super important to get everybody's uh, input. Yeah, but that's that's a very common story because, you know, and I used to run corporate strategy, we call them visioning workshops for major companies where we'd have a workshop to present initial analyses and the board, usually it's the board, needs to look at what we've presented and galvanize around a common vision for the company Mm. it never works if we tell them what their vision should be Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they have to look at the analysis have a long debate over lunch and dinner and then figure it out for themselves because they are personally vested in it because they developed it themselves Mm -hmm. and that's very common and if you look at going down the organization down the organization as you say it's not enough you send one memo that this is going to be our vision you as a leader You've got to constantly be finding different ways to explain the vision in new channels, in new modes, in new decisions being made so people can see the vision in action. I'm I'm sure you've seen that as well. Very much so. And ultimately, I believe strategy is action. So intention matters, attention matters, and action matters in strategy. And the more back to this spaciousness in the relationship, the more we give people control over their destiny, the more it will be embodied uh, in teams. And there's, so I mentioned energize in terms of uh, setting strategy, then there's sustaining, which is more about how are we connecting as a team? How are we aligning as a team? And then there's an important third pillar. And it's it's a pillar that very few people, when I did a when I looked at um, leaders, Enneagram types, there's there's three types that are more receptive or more passive. And I call them the regenerators. And the regenerators are about taking a pause. And I do believe that every organization, as we grow, we do need to take time to regenerate. Yes. And and the relentless pursuit of more has to stop. The rel- I just I'm going to repeat that because it seems counterintuitive. The relentless pursuit of more has to stop. I think we really have to look at as a collective, are we really solving problems as a business? Are we really contributing to society as businesses? How much is enough? And these are questions that the regenerative part of strategy helps with. And it's so, so, so important as we look at kind of our planet, we're in code red, um, we have literally become like a virus on the planet. So how do we take responsibility for our actions as organizations? I like what you're saying, because one of the things I tell clients is more is not better, better is better. Mm. If you're trying to, and it's very common, you know, we have clients who are trying to increase market cap by billions of dollars, as I'm sure it's the same for your clients as well. Mm-hmm. But they get into a trap of saying, I have a business model that works. So let me just do more of it. Mm-hmm. If I'm a mining company, I have 10 mines, and this is my market cap, why don't I have 20 mines and double my market cap? Versus saying, let me step back and ask me a question. Should I be in mining in the first place? Is that the way I create the most value for my shareholders? So in your experience, how hard is it to get clients to step back and see things in this new mindset that you're teaching them? Well, that's a great question, Michael. Initially, as I said, the profit mantra is kind of like the first one. It's dominant. The first All as MBAs just preaching profits. Yes. And I teach, I teach at Queens University yes, at an MBA cool. school. So, you know, and I think what's being asked of us right now as leaders is something else. And I, most leaders that we work with obviously are open to this. What I would encourage every leader to just consider is what is actually fulfilling for them individually, because it's just more money really fulfilling. Mm -hmm. Like to really, Michael, step back and back to this question of who. In fact, I was watching a story on the Beatles last night and they were saying, you know, we have all the money in the world. Yes. We have, and they, they went to India and they meditated. And that's actually where they were one, one of the most creative times. And it's they produced the most songs. It's interesting you should say that because I have that, I think it's a documentary. It's a four part documentary. 
oh, there's a four part documentary, but this one is about a Canadian who was actually with them during this meditation time. And he recounts his experience of sitting with all the different Beatles and the number of songs that were produced by actually meditating, by being in stillness. But and how that creatively is way more fulfilling than just more money. Yes. And the example you give is actually very, very relevant. And I want to unpack it for the audience so they think about this. If you look at a typical musician, a typical musician doesn't think like a business person. And of course, they get insulted when not thinking like business people. But in one way, they do it much better than a typical company. A typical MBA would say that, and I'm not generalizing, I'm just using MBAs as an example, yeah, would say that if an artist produced 50 songs, and they made so much money and royalties, why don't they produce 100 songs? But what good artists do is they don't focus on the volume of songs, they focus on the way they connect with people. And sometimes mm -hmm. you do fewer songs, but you have a deeper connection and you make more money, right? Mm -hmm. But as business people, we automatically don't think that way. We always think, more, more, more versus how do I do less and do it better and have, because all artists try to have a deeper connection. If you ask any single fan of any single singer in the world, and if you think about the you know, musicians you listen to as well, the reason you listen to this person because they speak to what you believe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But in businesses, I rarely see business executives, I'm sure you've seen this before, because I used to serve oil and gas companies and mining companies and utilities and Canada is big in resources. When you go to speak to any executive and you ask them, you know, what do you do? Very few of them talk about how do I better connect to my customers? Mm -hmm. and, it's and, so rare. And it's so rare. And how do I better connect to myself? Yes. So that I can then connect to my customers at a more deep level. Yeah. You know, the thing that I've always found very um, unusual when when CEOs and executives talk about employee churn and attrition, they make it sound like an industrial process. They make oh. it sound like, like there's something being skimmed off the top. When, when churn really means that someone joined your company, and if you plot them in a normal distribution, at least probably 30% had such a horrible experience, they never want to see this company again. Yeah. And imagine leaving that negative energy in someone who then takes it off into the workforce. And I like what you're saying a lot, because typically when we interview people about strategy on this podcast, it's always about the numbers and the analysis and the cash flow. And it's about you know, all these analytic tools that you apply. But one example I remember giving to a client is that he said that their company failed to enter the Indian market. And I tell him the company didn't fail. You just failed to find an executive who could mobilize and make employees enthusiastic to win in the market. It's a very big difference. And what you're talking about is how do you bring that enthusiasm back? How do you bring that energy back? How do you create a workforce whereby the employee wants to go to the office because that manager sees them for who they are? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of Ikigai. It's a Japanese concept. Are you familiar with it? Now you're definitely introducing me to some new things in this podcast. Okay, so think about, the, it's an intersection of four circles. And one is for everybody to think about what do you love? What does the world need? What can you get paid for? And what are you good at? And the intersection of that is where your leadership gifts will flourish. I like that. What is it called again? Ikigai, and it's spelled I-K-I-G-A-I. -I -I, and it's very important. Okay for leaders to consider and to use because by empowering all of this kind of our inner resources the financial will come and i say this as an experienced ceo yes. who's done it and helped many organizations with it so we need to in in essence we're turning our frame turning our mirror back inward to who yes. we are and and i don't know about you but I want to live every moment to the fullest. And if I'm not there, if I'm not present, how can I possibly do that? And how can I possibly serve myself, my customers? Um, so there's a real invitation here to look at ourselves as the kind of awakeners to our organizations to empower the type of world and also financial results that we want and a sense of radical responsibility around creating corporate cultures that drive financial results. Yes. I like the way you say it. I like the way we speak about it because 
you know, when you read about a company like, I'm going to use Apple as an example, because they just passed $3 trillion in market cap. Mm. And everyone's trying to copy Apple, but no one ever asked the question, how does Tim Cook make decisions? Yes. What is he doing when he's alone? And how is he thinking about things? What does Tim Cook ask himself every minute of every day? How does he start his day? Who does he listen to? How does he set up that morning routine when he just gets out of bed? What does he think about? In strategy, those are the things you need to be thinking about because you're trying to role model successful people, but we don't do it enough the way you're talking about it. We just want to look at their balance sheet income statement. Who are the suppliers? What are they working on? What's the R&D focused on? But we strip out the human element, but really it's the human element that makes everything else possible. Exactly. So look at role models like Tim Cook and then turn again, turn inwards and say, what would work for me to exactly. for me to be at my best, for me to best be the best leader that I can be so it empowers everything that our organizations are doing. That is, that is the real, that is the real invitation. And to stop, we're on this treadmill that's literally burning up the planet to stop, for us all to stop, pause and really examine what it is that we want to create and build in our organizations. I truly believe that organizations will solve the greatest challenges of our time when we work differently together. Yes, I agree with you with that. I think that, you know, I asked the first question at the beginning is, are companies not humane enough? And the answer is obviously no, because we can always do things better. That, that is right. And also to remember our humanity and to be kind uh, to ourselves as leaders. I mentioned that people rate the worst time of the day as their time with their bosses. And the majority of people leave an organization because of, because of their direct supervisor, because of their direct boss. So we need to look at as leaders, and I don't mean it to come down as a heavy, but as leaders, are we really showing up? Yes. Are we really being humane? Are we really being kind and impactful? And showing up doesn't mean being present. It means being present for who you are. And that means knowing who you are first. Exactly. And when we ask leaders, you know, who are you and what is your personal name? Often it's crickets. Michael, yes. it's crickets. I agree so with that. The invitation is how do we create uh, for leaders to create their personal aim and to keep focused on it? And to keep learning and growing, the other piece of research I'd like to bring in is Carol Dweck's research, um, growth mindset versus closed mindset. The closed mindset is just relentlessly kind of after the targets, whereas the growth mindset is, okay, maybe we didn't hit that target. Why? Yeah, and yeah. what do we need to learn from it? So the more we can bring that growth mindset to our entire lives in every aspect of our life and our businesses, actually, the more successful we will be. Yes. And there's a good build up to that. Our CEO was a very, very smart lady, always does this exercise when she works with executives, whereby she looks at their diaries to see how much time they have for thinking. Mm. Because you don't have time for thinking. How can you expose yourself to new things that can trigger creativity? You have to strategy, most people forget, is mostly thinking about what you're seeing it's not analysis. That's a small part of it. But once you do the analysis, you got to spend a lot of time thinking about what does this mean? Why is it telling me this? And Michael, here's a small practice that I would like to invite everybody listening to this practice, to this podcast to do. And it's about centering ourselves. So what I'd like is if everybody could just bring your attention to your right arm. Okay, let, let me just get into the right posture for this. My yeah, right just posture. get into get into the posture. So, and if you're driving, don't don't, don't do it do when you're driving, please. <laughs> or flying a plane, or managing my investment account, don't do it. But, but imagine just before a meeting or just before you start your day, here's a small practice that you can use to be more centered and more present in your work. So direct application. And it's something that many boards of directors that I work with, that we work with, begin with. And also many leaders begin with when they're, especially when they're in a contentious situation. So let's, uh, yeah, so just relax. Now bring your attention to your right arm. Bring your attention to your right arm. Next, bring your attention to your right leg. Attention to your right leg. Then your attention to your left leg. 
attention to your left leg, attention to your left arm, attention to your left arm. Now bring your attention to your entire body, attention to your entire body. Thank you. How was that practice for you, Michael? Oh, I loved it. You, you don't have to sell me on these things. I'm well aware of the importance of doing two things. What this does is it breaks a pattern immediately because we get so caught up into doing what we've always done. It makes us stressful when you don't get the same results. This immediately forces you to step back and that alone is very valuable. And then it calms you and because you can be in the worst situation, but when you're doing this exercise, you're automatically becoming calm. Mm. You stop thinking about yourself mm. and you start thinking about what can I do versus what do I want? I'm a big believer in these exercises. I do them quite a lot. I find them very, very helpful. You know, as you probably know, in the world of management consulting, investment banking, private equity, venture capital, and so on, people put themselves on a treadmill from the time they're roughly 18 years old, get into an MBA school, work for the right place, and they hope for the time to get to about 35 to 40 to finally live the life they want, right? Mm. So what I find useful about these exercises is that it forces you to spend time thinking about who you are and what you want. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you don't do that, you can end up in a very bad place when you're 35. I've seen it to so many, happen to so many clients. So when I first started off in corporate strategy and so on, I always used to laugh at these things. I'll be honest. I always thought, oh, just touchy feely things. Why do people want me to do this? Right. But the thing is, as you get older, you realize that the art of strategy is leadership. Mm -hmm. And you can't lead unless you can lead yourself. And if you don't take the time to pause and understand where you are as a person, how can you possibly get other people to do that as well? Yes. And it also allows us the discretionary space to make the best decisions. So when we're more centered, we can just do that little mini practice before making big decisions and kind of check in with, is my, is this in alignment with my, with my gut? Is it alignment with my heart? Is it in alignment with my head? So it gives us space. It also rewires our brain to help us make better decisions. So yes. it's, you know, it's a simple practice and you're right about, you know, in my twenties, I would have said, no, 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 no. This is not a good, this is not, I'm this not. This is a waste no of time. I don't want to take this elective for my MBA. Don't sign me up. But it's true, right? We were all like that when we were young. Yes. And I hope that the future, future generations of leaders begin meetings this way. You know, when I did my MBA at Queens, our team was, we were an amazing team. And I think, wow, we would have been far more creative had we not just taken a few pauses. Yes. And recalibrate it. So one, that's one, of, one of the things I've seen works very well when I have meetings is that if the meeting goes off agenda, don't think it's a bad thing. Mm, mm -hmm. Because sometimes someone introduces something that is not on the agenda, but it triggers some amazing insight for the team. Mm -hmm. And if we're taught to be efficient and productive, you must stick to your meeting agenda. But I've learned over time, if the meeting goes off agenda, forget about it. Go with what the team's excited about, because maybe there's something there. Yes, I think it's important to definitely follow energy when it's creative and when it's in, in stream. And not every situation allows for that. So when it doesn't allow for it, here's what I've done is I have kind of a parking lot sheet. Yes, yeah, and, I do that as well. You know, put up the parking lot and let people and then have another meeting around it. I'm also a big um, believer in just having meetings to ask questions and listen. Yes. And that, that would be another practice that I would recommend, you know, have a brainstorming meetings on problems, no solutions, just, just well, solutions, but no, no coming to conclusion. Yes. And I like letting that. it sit and stew. Speaking about mindfulness techniques, I'll tell you what I thought was the most effective mindfulness technique I've ever seen with a CEO of a fortune 500 company. And this mm -hmm. was a gentleman who ran one of the biggest resources companies in the world. I mean, a very hard charging man known for his tough business decisions. He just, you know, fires people and all kinds of things. I mean, he doesn't do anything bad. He just takes tough, he makes the tough calls. Mm. The thing that really I liked about him is that every meeting he ever had, he'd want people to take their shoes off and do it in their socks. That was the funniest thing I've ever seen when I saw it. But that simple act automatically changed the, the tone of the meeting. Oh, I love it. And it's also very, very symbolic too, with being, you know, in your stocking feet. One thing I also believe is like having creative 
tools yes, in our yes. boardrooms uh because i think that insights a sense of play yeah and when we're playing we're far more creative and having music in organizations and different art in organizations and i just invite i love that example you gave michael because anytime we can break the automatic yes is where alchemy happens you need pattern breakers as much as you can and i like this example of uh, music in a boardroom i've only seen that once before but it again it it completely changes the mood and dynamic no one's at war with each other it, it's no longer a meeting of frustration it's a creative process yes and the more creative we are the more we're going to really solve the problems that we face as a collective and so there's a real invitation with awakening organizations and with uh organizations listening to this podcast to bring in creative elements yes. and to practice things that stop our automatic we're not always good on treadmills sometimes we need to do yoga just as an example you know yeah you have to be a little bit um i think for a lot of people listening to this they're going to be too scared to try things but what i would say is that you should fear what's going to happen if you don't try new things. Oh, that's brilliant. And you know, Michael, I would sit in front of boards of directors and I sit in front of boards of directors and I will lead a mindfulness practice. And the first few years that I did it, I would literally be sweating profusely. So I was really leaning into my discomfort. Yes. So I would invite yes. leaders to lean into their discomfort. The other thing is I'm a big uh empiricist. So I look at the data in terms of yes. what helps us to make great decisions as leaders and mindfulness it overwhelmingly is supported that the more mindful we are, more self-aware we are as leaders, the higher performing we are. So I would say we can't afford not to do this. and to get for us all to lean into our discomforts like picture me you know sitting there often i'd be the only woman yes. in the boardroom yes. not so much anymore that's changing and i would lead a mindfulness exercise this is over a decade ago and i'd literally be sweating however the the companies continue to do it because they realize with practice it empowers something else yes i really like this podcast because not enough people talk about this Well okay here's a question for you Michael why do you think people aren't talking about it I think because people are scared I think that a leader is often scared to say that they are not sure what to do we we train people we reward them for being decisive and anything that shows you are not decisive or you don't know and you're not bringing yourself to the work it's seen as a sign of weakness it's a lack of courage for lack of a better word that's my take on it mm and What's interesting is I think one of the most courageous acts in the world is to say I don't know. Exactly. And, and the reality is all of our businesses are experiments and the more we can take that angle and approach and an attitude of the growth mindset of what am I learning here? How am I developing as a human being as a human soul that you know how amazing it is that we're all actually on this planet and yes. am i really living into my own my own potential and one of the tools that i use with leaders is am i coming so picture a piece of paper draw a, a line across your piece of paper and think about am i coming from my awakened place or am i coming from my asleep place and asleep you could consider automatic and awaken is like challenging the status quo stepping into our potential leaning yeah. into our fears um getting uncomfortable as leaders because that's where the magic actually is it's not in the automatic default of oh i have to show up at the office yes, 8 yes. to 5 it's it's am i coming which am i am i more awakened self or am i more my asleep self yes i completely agree with you and i think one of the points i was going to make is that um is when people do this it's going to look silly the first time because you're going to be one of the few people in your company or probably any group you have doing it but you shouldn't let that stop you Mm -hmm. It's okay to be silly. You know, we use the word playfulness and so on, and that's true. That's a lot of that is missing in business today whereby people are so scared to hit their numbers, they're so scared to be different 
that they just repeat more of what everyone else is doing. The biggest piece of advice I always give management consultants, we work with them quite a lot, is never call yourself an expert. Because when you call yourself an expert, you rob yourself of the gift of co-creating something with a client, because you, you're you going to have to position yourself as someone already knows the answer, but you oftentimes don't know the answer. Mm-hmm. And if you set your, if you set that trap for yourself, you will have an unhappy career as a consultant. It will automatically happen. So never call yourself an expert. You can be an expert at solving a problem, but you never know the answer before you arrive. And don't take away that joy. I always say it's joy when you go in and you don't know the answer and you solve it with the client. And I'm sure that applies to every industry as well. Mm, that's, that's so true. And our interrelationship and our interdependency. And also that we, we don't know. Like, look at COVID. We didn't know COVID was coming. Yeah, and absolutely. So just moment by moment by moment and our interrelationship with each other. I think that's such a beautiful thing to not know the answer and we're going to co-create it together. That creates a different field. So back to what we we're saying, you know, talking about kind of people as assets, even the terms we use like human resources. Yes. Well, oh, wow. Humans are not assets. Humans it's are terrible human terms. Beings. It's terrible terms. I, I, the terminology, the problem is we don't realize the language we use creates a certain kind of culture. It does. And so for us to really get reflective in terms of how are we referring to people? These are people often with families and they're not an asset. They're not a widget. They're far more than that. So we really need to re-examine how we treat people in organizations and to honor people's humanity and to treat people with kindness, with compassion. And the kind thing can often, it can sometimes be saying you're not a fit for this role. And that's Mm -hmm. okay if it's kind. It's, It's the intention behind our organizations. It's not just about the finances. We need to create, and business leaders can do this, create a different world for future generations. Yes, because we often forget that when someone joins a company, they're trusting you with their future. They could work anywhere else, but they're saying in this important formative years of my professional career, whether it's 22 to whatever period it is, I'm going to trust you that you're going to give me the skills and the lifestyle I want and the acknowledgement I want. It's it's an important thing. We we think of employment as a contract base. Actually, it's trust, isn't it? Oh, and trust is is so huge. Trust makes everything go faster. And if we don't have trust, it's like imposing a tax on an organization. It makes everything go slower. When there is trust, everything goes much, much, much faster and much more fluidly. So the people we work with, it's so important to ingrain trust. And when we make a mistake as leaders, to own up to it and admit it, and that's, that, again, builds trust. So trust is, is a huge ingredient in terms of um, the stew of creating an awakened company because it makes everything go faster. When I trust you, I'm not going to second guess you doing something. I'm not going to have to put in a number of protocols, which slows yes. things down. So very, very, very important point, Michael, is how trust makes everything faster and also more fun. Yes, we can call it the trust tax on companies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we don't want to employ a trust trust tax where, you know, the leaders continually second guessing what uh, people are doing or not trusting what they're doing. So they put in protocols to make things happen. Which, um, which leads to even less trust in the company, actually. <laughs> exa- exactly. And then we get the kind of results that we've been speaking about, you know. Catherine, thank you so much. I really enjoyed that podcast. I think our audience is going to enjoy it immensely. Is there anything you want to add before we wrap up? Yes. Uh, To everyone listening, just know that you are the catalyst and you are the awakener. And please apply everything that uh, Michael and I have spoken about today. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Catherine. I also want to add something that we have a lot of listeners in emerging markets. I know that we're big in China and so on. If you're listening to this and you do not come from what you think is a position whereby you think you cannot make a change, whether you don't work at the right company, you don't have the right career, you didn't go to the right schools, I think the most important thing is to remember that you can do anything you want if you set your mind to it. It doesn't matter where you start. It's about your intention and knowing yourself. 
And I think that's the most important thing to take out of this because we're talking about knowing yourself and we talk a lot about leaders, but if you're not a leader yet, you're still a leader in training and that's a good place to be. Thank you so much, Catherine. I really enjoyed that. We'll be in touch. Thank you, Michael. Take care. Ciao. Bye for now.